Hey there, it's the real Jason Duncan. I've got a special announcement for you really quick. I am hosting the Exit Lifestyle Conference in Nashville, Tennessee, February 3rd, 4th, and 5th. 2022. You don't want to miss it. Go to theexitlifestyle.com to learn more. You could read every book in the universe about life and success and growth, and it won't change your life. But what will change your life is putting that principle into action. And so my invitation to you right now is to one, identify that one thing that you're hearing for you. And two, ask yourself, how can I attach this to action and bring it into my reality in the next 24 hours? Like, what are you committed to doing about what you have learned? Take that insight, attach it to action, commit to doing it and go do it. I love that. And, and what's really interesting is that if you go back, if I could do a montage of all the answers to that question, because I asked that of everybody, um, the, so many people are saying the same kind of thing. Take action. You got to go do this. Quit thinking about it. Go do it. The, mm -hmm. the magic, as you use the term, the magic is in the action. It's in the activity. It's the doing of the thing. In today's ultra-competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Welcome back to another episode of The Root of All Success. I'm the real Jason Duncan. Thank you for being here. It's always an honor to be able to talk to you. And I want to do a shout out. I've got a lot of friends and family members who, who occasionally come up to me and say, hey, Jason, I, I absolutely listen to your show every time it comes out. And for those of you who do that, I just want to say how much I appreciate that. This is a labor of love for me. I really enjoy putting the show out there. I love getting guests on just like today's guests. I love getting guests on the show that are super successful. And, and, and I want to share their story with you so that you can be more successful as an entrepreneur. I want to say a big thanks to the C-Suite Radio Network and the TV Network for having us syndicated. So we've gone every podcast player thanks to the C-Suite Network. And we are just recently putting out episodes on the C-Suite TV Network. So you can watch me on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash the real Jason Duncan. And we're now on C-suite TV. So we'll be giving you more information in the coming weeks about how to access C-suite TV, but that's C hyphen suite S U I T E TV. You can go take a look at us there. Well, let me introduce today's guest. So today's guest is Katie Richardson. She's the founder and CEO of a company called Pudge. That's P-U-J. And, and uh, I met her. She and I spoke at a conference together um, um, back in September of 2021. Uh, and I had never met her before, not heard of her. And I was blown away by meeting her and hearing her speak on stage, hearing her story. And I was so excited to get to meet her. I said, hey, Katie, I would really love for you to come on the show. And she agreed. And I'm happy to have her on the show today. But let me tell you a little bit about her. Her mission is to help entrepreneurs step into their calling uh, to find their voice and to bring their magic. And you'll hear us talk about that word magic on the show a little bit today. Her brand, Pudge, is a worldwide sensation reaching over 2,000 stores in the U.S. and distribution in 26 different company, countries. Uh, with, with a sketch and a giant leap of faith, Katie transformed an industry and became a globally recognized designer and an entrepreneur. And she's been featured on shows. I'll talk about this a little bit in the show today, but Ellen DeGeneres show, Rachel Ray show, today's show. And she was even on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. Her story is one of grit and determination and passion. You'll hear about how she met that one person that changed her life by accident in a store, just a little boutique store and how that changed her life 
forever. She calls herself an accidental entrepreneur. I didn't know that until I recorded the show with her. And I too call myself an accidental entrepreneur. So I want you to enjoy this show today as we talk with the one and only Katie Richardson. Welcome, Katie Richardson, to the show. I am so glad that you're here. It was such a cool thing to meet you not too long ago, and now you're on the show. So thank you for being here. The real Jason Duncan. I am honored to be here, excited to share with your audience today. Well, it's uh, it was really cool to meet you. I know that we when we spoke at a, we both spoke at the same event back in uh, Colorado, back in, I think it was September of 2021. And uh, so one, one of the things I did before going to the event, as I reached out to all the speakers that were on the docket, which re- which was one was you, uh, you and I had never met. I honestly hadn't heard of you. I, I didn't know anything about your company. And but I reached out to you and I remembered your hair. You have such cool hair. <laughs> I just remember the curls. And so when I saw you in person, I'm like, hey, you're one of the one of the speakers because we didn't really know each other when we got there. And uh, we had that first night sitting at that tent top dinner together, got to talk about it. And then. Holy crap, you got on stage and absolutely killed it. Uh, so you did a fantastic job. So I, I'm, yeah. I'm honored that we're sitting here together doing the show today. <laughs> Jason, I thought the same of you. Like, you're such a master on stage. It was awesome to watch you perform. Well, thank you. I, I enjoy it a lot. And of course, I had lots of lots of uh, experience doing that 13 years in ministry and then four years in the school school system as a teacher uh, gives you the ability to stand on stage. You may not be very good, but at least you can stand up there and act like it. <laughs> hey. Hey. Well, let me ask you this. So you are uh, you've been on the the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. You've been on the Today Show. You've been on Rachel Ray Show, the Ellen DeGeneres Show. Um, it's it that that takes that takes some pretty big success and a great story to end up on uh, to be featured like that. So why don't we go back? I want to we'll get there. I'm sure. But Katie, tell okay. tell me what was your first foray into the whole entrepreneur game? How did you, what was your first thing that you did entrepreneurial? Even as a kid, but like, what was your first thing? So I am not your typical entrepreneur. And the article that was written about me in entrepreneur magazine is called the accidental entrepreneur. And in some ways I was kind of pushed into it because I like making things. I like problem solving I'm an innovator and a product designer, and I was really successful at it in school. I received a um, scholarship from General Motors. I won national design awards. And at the same time, I never envisioned myself being a professional woman. I had always wanted to be a mother. And so I got a degree. I did very well in school. And then once school was over, I was like, okay, I guess I'm done. And lo and behold, God had other plans for me. And the way that I got into entrepreneurship is I was just shopping in a store and the store owner attacked me. And she said, where did you get all this stuff? And I had, I had my two-year-old and my newborn in my, in a baby carrier that I had made. And I was really unsure of myself at that time, Jason, I had done well in school, but then like, I, I never really worked professionally. And I did a few odd jobs here and there, but when she attacked me, I was really unsure of myself and I didn't want to assume she was talking about all the things that I had made. And she specifically pointed it out a hat. I had made some baby shoes and a baby carrier. And so she was like these, and she points them all out. I said, Oh, you like those? I made them. And she was like, you made these, these are hot. I go to all the trade shows. These are hot. I want you to make them for my store. And all these walls came up. I was like, are you kidding me? Can't you see I have my hands full? I've got a newborn. I have a toddler. Like, I I don't have time to make this for you. Like, I was really pushing back on her. And she said something that, Jason, that totally changed my life. She grabbed me by the shoulders, looked me square in the eyes. And she said, look, I understand that you have your hands full and you're really busy right now. But in five years, these kids are going to be in school full time. And you will look back and you will wish that you had done something about it. And as a woman of faith, a woman of God, I like that word talents really rang true to me. And I was, I was like, okay, I know God's not okay with that. And I just, I had never, I'd never been able to square being a professional woman an entrepreneur and being a mother in my mind and a righteous woman. Like the three just didn't go together in my mind at that time. Well, you, what, she, so how old were your kids? How old and how many kids do you have when you're walking through the store that day? How old were the kids? They were like two and a half and then seven or eight months. So you had two kids walking through a department store, just wearing stuff that you'd made, all, have this stuff and this complete stranger 
Uh, what's her, what, what's her first name? Her name's Meryl. Meryl. So Meryl yeah. walks up to you. Meryl says, Hey, what's the stuff? Yeah. And little did you know that conversation was going to change your life because you weren't really interested in entrepreneurship. It sounds like you were just a designer who really just had a passion for making cool stuff for yourself. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to make it through the day, honestly, Jason, like two young boys who just wanted to wrestle all day and just play. And I was just trying to keep up with them. So the idea of having a business, that was just like the furthest thing from my mind. So what happened after that conversation with Meryl? Did you guys stay in touch? We did. She became my first customer. I I told her I would think about it. And I came home (laughs) and I mentioned it to my husband at dinner after he got home from work. And I was like, can you believe this? Like the wildest thing happened today. Isn't this crazy? And he was like, Katie, no, she's not crazy. She's right. You need to do something. And he, he could see that I was really talented as well. And I, I again, like gave him all of my excuses and excuses. And he was like, look, we'll figure it out. And no, you're not going to sew them. We'll find somebody else to sew these things. And he just was really optimistic. And my husband is very entrepreneurial minded. He was from a really early age. And so he helped me change my thinking in a lot of ways. Like I was just getting in my way, Jason, it's like totally so, getting in my way. Well, and then I think that that happens to a lot of entrepreneurs who are fearful about what might happen. And, and, uh, you were, I, I love the phrase, the accidental entrepreneur. Um, I didn't know that that was the title of the article they wrote about you. And, uh, I had never heard anybody else use that phrase until you just shared that with me. I refer to myself as an accidental entrepreneur all the time. So you yeah. and I have a very similar, I'm although I'm yeah. I wasn't the creative uh, <laughs> maker and designer that you are, but, uh, you know, we both have that in common of, being thrust into entrepreneurialism, whether we wanted to or not. So, so your kids were really young yeah. um, to, you know, two and a half and seven or eight months. So how, how old are those kids today? So how long ago <laughs> was this? So I'm trying to My get My oldest is a senior in high school. He is 17 and a half and I've got four kids now and they are 17, 15, 13 and eight. Wow. Yeah. So we're talking a 15 a year, 15 year journey of you doing the, doing the entrepreneur thing. Yep. So now designing and making things and, and I would, you know what, I'd be interested to know your perspective on this. So designing and making things as an inventor or a creative person Mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship about building businesses are completely different. And that's why most designers and inventors aren't entrepreneurs. Uh, And then most entrepreneurs aren't designers and inventors it takes a unique and special person to meld those into the one thing. Mm -hmm. So, were you always the entrepreneurial minded person or did that grow at, from the design and invention side? I think there was evidence of me being an entrepreneur, maybe at a younger age. And it showed up in ways that I didn't like being told what to do. It's not that I didn't want to do what was right or good in the world. From a young age, I remember my mom was a piano teacher and she would try and get me to play the piano. I didn't like it. I hated it. And I finally started to write my own songs on the piano. And then I really liked it. I liked creation from a really young age. I liked doing my own thing. And I started to figure out that I liked playing the piano. And I remember one time specifically, I was walking into the living room to go play the piano. And my mom yelled from the kitchen, hey, Katie, why don't you play the piano? And it was just like instantly, I was like, dang it, you ruined it. Because now I was doing it because she told me to, not because I wanted to. So from a really young age, I had this kind of, strong free will. And I liked doing what I wanted to do on my terms. And, um, but I wasn't overt about it. Right. I wasn't a really, uh, verbose person and I didn't speak up my opinion very often. It was very internal for me. And I, I was an observer. I was a little bit more quiet and held back a lot in my youth. And it wasn't until, you know, growing up and maturing that I started to realize, oh, actually I do have an opinion and I do have a perspective and I do want to do it my way. And the way you're doing it, eh, it doesn't work for me. So early on you had this design and this, uh, this design, I, this design kind of gifting. And you also had this discovery of, Hey, this, is my opinion actually means something and I want to do it. So this independent spirit, and then you run into Merrill and you, you, you've designed these cool things 
Now you're thrust into accidental entrepreneurship to build a business. What was the business like when you first started? Did you, did, was it was it exactly what it ended up being in terms of name and organizational structure oh. and, and and purpose, or did it right. did it change? Yeah, that's a great question. It was not so. The the company now is Pudge P U J. That's not what it was in the beginning. Uh, it was called Zoo Z U Modern, and uh, I had good success with that. And um, my tagline was taming the daily zoo. And I had a couple of products that I was making domestically and I was selling to stores in Portland and Seattle and San Francisco. But I started to like, as I was getting more stores and I was gaining uh, momentum and awareness around my brand, I started to look bigger, um, meaning internationally. And I looked internationally and there was a potential trademark issue with ZU in France. And I was like, Hmm, I mean, I'm not in France right now. And I remember talking to my brother, he's an attorney. I just said, Hey, you know, someday I would like to be an international company. And it looks like there's a potential name trademark issue in France. And he said, look, you could potentially fight that and, you know, try and, and, and win it over and be really particular about your categories. He said, but if you want to ask me, he said, I would stay as far away from a lawsuit as you can. He said, why don't you just change your name? And I'm like, easy for you to say, geez, <laughs> I just yeah. changed the name. Like I got a brand and awareness and people who are liking the product. And at first I was really bugged and annoyed and I uh, was fighting it internally. And after I kind of like had my little fit, I was like, okay, what if I took the last 12 months of experience? Cause I didn't really know what I was doing when I first started. Right. What if I took that the last 12 months of experience and I started new and I learned from the last 12 months and I created a new brand for myself. And so I just made that decision and it was not easy for sure. We can become really attached to our own creations, but I was like, I'm going to start over. And I got out my journal and I was like, I want a short name and I want it to be three letters and I want it to be something that I can trademark and own both domestically and internationally. I want it to have good SEO rankings from the get-go. I want to own the .com. Like I, I started setting out the constraints, which is what you do when you're designing, by the way. I started identifying all the constraints of what my ideal brand name would have. And then I just started writing out all the potential names. And P Pudge is often a name used. It's like a term of endearment for a chubby, happy baby. And I liked it. I, my mother had a friend who at a really young age was called Pudge. And then even as a grandmother, they still called her Pudge. And I was like, I really like this name. I like how cute and friendly it is. And I like that it's about the baby and not the products. And so I did, I made the switch and it like, it has been one of the best decisions ever. And how deep were you into, you. <laughs> so how, how deep were you into the, like you'd started a company mm -hmm. and now you're rebranding the company. How many yeah. years from start to rebrand? So I move quickly. So, um, I mean, I had been using that other brand name for about a year, maybe 18 months, but I had been doing low production. So it's not like I had tooling in Asia with this brand. I had been doing, working with domestic manufacturers and I was kind of, um, being really clever about it. Like, um, the tags that had my name were, were screen printed on a ribbon. So like there wasn't, there wasn't a huge investment when it came to the brand, but there's an effort to make those changes. And, um, yeah, I just made the decision. I bought the .com. I, um, trademarked it and even started to look internationally. At what it. Year? We were in like 25 stores. I think. So what year was that? 2008. Okay. Wow. So 2009. we're 2009. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you got, you got started in, uh, uh, what seven, 2006, yep. 2007 as, yep. as an official company with your mm -hmm. design, selling your designs, you rebranded to pudge at, in uh, 2008, 2009. And, so you continue to develop products, but what you had one product that seemed, at least from my outside looking in, hearing your story, one product that really kind of took it, took the market by storm was like, this is the one that everybody wanted to talk about. Do you want to talk a little bit about how yeah. that came to light? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I love talking about physical, physical products. Um, so when I got started, I was using a cut and sew product. It was a baby carrier. That was a piece of fabric that I, I, 
purchased the fabric wholesale. I shipped it to somebody who washed it because I needed it pre-shrunk. And then he shipped it to someone who cut and sew the product. And if anybody knows anything about products and manufacturing, there's not any tooling required. Like usually you're spending tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in a tool to manufacture your products. This could be done at really low production costs and low overhead to me. And so that allowed me to get started. But the thing about that product was it was unique. I mean, everything I make is unique, but it wasn't a game changer. And it was a Christmas break that my husband and I said, hey, over the next two weeks, why don't you and I design something that will allow him to quit his job and us to work together and a brand, a product, a company that can become our full-time gig and we can do it together. And so that's what we did over Christmas break. We started drawing, we started sketching and came up with an idea on paper of a concept that was an infant bathtub that hangs in stores flat and folds into a little bucket seat that fits into your bathroom sink. And it solved the storage issues and the materials that we were going to use solved like mold and mildew issues. It was easy to set up. It was comfortable and cradled the baby. So the baby wasn't going to cry. Like we seriously wrote all of the pain points that we personally had as parents around bath time. And we said, let's just make a product that solves all of these problems. And that's what we did. I mean, and, we're really good designers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, uh, the or origin of that idea was that yours or his, or is it a combination or what? It was definitely a combination. Yeah. yeah. And we worked together on paper. That's yeah. great. And then, that. and that product, that's the one that where you started to get noticed by magazines and television yes. shows. And they were like, Hey, who is this? Who's the designer behind this really cool bathtub thing for kids or for infants? And they found out that it was you. It's, it's Katie. It's Katie Richardson. It's, it's the, it's worth Ben too, but right. But yes. it's Katie Richardson and it's Pudge and this company. And now, you're on the national international scene. Yeah. And it, it ended up being exactly what I described. It was a total game changer and it exploded Jason. And um, I took it to a trade show in 2010, 20, yeah, 2010. I was pregnant with my third. I showed it to store buyers at Target and Costco and Nordstrom. And everyone was really curious about it, but nobody placed an order. It was devastating. I came home feeling like a total failure. I was embarrassed to talk to my family about it. I didn't even want to talk to my husband about it because it was that painful and embarrassing. I mean, we'd worked for two plus years to develop it and we were already paying attorneys to get it trademarked. Nobody placed an order. And when I came home from that show and I was telling him, nobody wants it, it failed. Like time to give up on the dream. Looks like you need to keep working for the man. And uh, he said, actually, Katie, are you still there? Yep. Oh, sorry. You disappeared for a second. Hold right, on. Well, just go back and start the beginning of that part of the story. Editors will yeah. uh, pick it up. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Like Came back from the trade show. You didn't want to tell your husband, didn't want to tell anybody. Okay. Start there. So I come home from the trade show and I felt like a complete and total failure as a designer, as a provider, as a, as a mother, just as a human being, I felt like a total failure. He listens to me, give him the play-by-play -play of the show. And I told him how they were asking me questions like, what are your wholesale price? What's your retail price? What does the retail package look like? What are your lead times? Um, what are your case pack minimums? And do you carry insurance for this? And I honestly was way out of my league, Jason. I had been an entrepreneur for a couple of years at that point, but I'd been working with small stores. I hadn't talked to big store buyers. I was making stuff domestically. And honestly, what they were looking at was a really good prototype that I'd made on my kitchen table. And I didn't have the answers to all of those questions. So as I shared that with him, he was like, they didn't actually mean to say no. They just asked you questions that we didn't have the answers to. And we just need to answer those questions and they'll all buy. Katie, answer those questions and we'll be shipping this product all over the world. Jason, what he was saying sounded like total madness. I, we were standing in our cold garage, literally surrounded by all the dust and the remnants and the scraps of this harebrained idea that we'd been working on for two plus years. I was wearing the same dang pair of jeans I'd worn for the last five years because I couldn't even afford new outfits. I was just tired. I was cold. I was worn out. And so when he said that, my mind just wanted to be like, dang it. No, can't you hear me? <laughs> like I'm done. And instead my body just was on fire. And I was like, he's right. 
<laughs> and we took that experience of quote failure and we used it as a blueprint for success. And the next year I went and I answered every one of those questions and we took it back to the trade show. And that moment changed my life because everybody who came into the booth at that point placed an order, everybody, everybody. Wow. So what does it look like to go to a trade show? You pay money to be there and mm-hmm. buyers show up and they're representing their stores, their brand, you know, their, their distribution methods, however they're distributing products. And then when they place an order, what does that mean? Like, are, how many are they buying? Is this, are we talking thousands of products, hundreds of products more? What do you, what, what's it look like? Yeah. So at the time, like retail has changed so much in the last 15 years at the time, products like mine could get massive distribution in small stores called boutiques. And they were specialty stores that knew their customer, which was a young pregnant woman who had a baby and a newborn. And all of a sudden she had all these new needs and they were servicing her at a really high level. And it was a very uh, high level service and it was unique, special products that you couldn't get at Target or Walmart. Right. And, um, and so That's how we built our business because unlike the baby sling, which was cut and sew, this product, I I had to place huge orders to get factories to to pay any attention to me. And I had zero funding. Mm. So we had to figure out how to get a, a, a massive amount of orders all at the same time. And that's why we had to do the trade show. And so my minimums were... 25 units, which for a small boutique, that felt like a lot. But for me, it was just like, I honestly, I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, well, I can fit a lot in a, in a box for, of 25. Like, and so people were ordering them in units of 25, 50 and everybody who was coming in, that's placing an order. It added up really fast. And we were able to fill a whole container. You see those containers that come from Asia on the water and you see them on the road on a semi I filled a whole container with those and they'd already been like, they were already sold. Wow. Now, do you have a picture? Do you have a picture <laughs> oh, yeah. of standing in front of one of those containers? <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Isn't and the wild, the wild piece is my husband went to find us a factory and like source the raw goods and even set up tooling before this trade show. And like I said, we didn't have the money to do it. Like we sent him over there on a credit card. He gets to the factory. He had convinced before he got there, he had convinced the factory owner to import the raw goods from Korea. And he tells the story of standing outside this factory, backing up the truck of raw goods, thinking in his mind, I sure hope I can pay for all of this. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And he went in with tremendous confidence and certainty in what it is that we were building and that we would figure it out. Well, and we did. It, it, and, and I applaud you because that is how entrepreneurs become successful as they push beyond yeah. that. And what's right. interesting, Katie, is that in this, on this show, the root of all success, part of what I do when we're talking about these stories is I've been interviewing people like you for a long time now, casually over a bourbon or whatever at the club or, yeah. or professionally on the show. And I've, I've found over these years of doing these, these interviews is that these same five keys are used by everybody, just like you, to unlock success. And the first key and the most important key is that is, is that a passion? And I hear that in your story. And I want to I get your response to this because I believe that passion, there's two sides of passion. There's, there's the emotional, I really like it thing. Then that's what people think that, well, just find something you're passionate about that you like and you'll succeed. Bull. There's so many people that have done things that they liked and failed miserably. It's not just about whether you like it, although that helps. It's about the other side of passion, which is a mental side of passion. It is the willingness to endure for your cause. That's what passion really Really means. That's why we call it the passion of the Christ. It wasn't that he was excited to go to the cross. It was that he was willing to endure for a cause. So I hear in your story and specifically in that story about Ben going over to, to Asia and, and not knowing, can we afford this? But that passion, you guys were willing to endure for the thing that you're building. Even if it failed, you were willing to push through. Is that how you see it? Oh, hundred percent. And, and as I love that, preframe on passion and what it means and how you can see that in me. And I think people would be surprised to learn what my passion was. It wasn't what you might expect. 
Well, so what was it? (laughs) (laughs) So in those early days when I was selling locally to small boutiques and I was doing the cut and sew product before we had the tub and I was in that internal conflict between me and what it meant to be a righteous woman and a mother and, you know, present with my husband, as it was in that internal wrestle, I was, my fear was going down this road of entrepreneurship and destroying what was most important to me. I'd seen too much evidence of people being entrepreneurs, business owners, and being so distracted by their business that it ended up destroying their marriage. They didn't have a relationship with their kids. They lost their health. I'd seen too much evidence of that. And I was terrified by that. And so I was looking for proof that this was possible, that I could be a righteous woman, a present and loving and committed wife, an incredible entrepreneur and pursue the gifts and talents that God had given me. And I was looking for proof and evidence of that. This was like 2006, 2007. Uh, The internet was still very young and Facebook didn't exist. Like social media wasn't around. At least it was for weird high school kids, but (laughs) you didn't see professionals. So I'm like reading books from the library. I'm looking for proof that it's possible. And specifically, I'm even looking for a woman who's done it. And it's not to say she didn't exist. I just couldn't find her. I couldn't find her. And yet at the same time, I couldn't put it down. I couldn't put down entrepreneurship. And so I'm in this wrestle and I'm asking God, I'm praying, I'm looking for answers. And one day I had a new thought. And I really feel like sometimes we can have these thoughts that are inspired, they come from God. And it was, Katie, you might not see her, the woman that proves that this is possible, but you're a creator. I've taught you creation, you know design. And while you can't find her, you can create her. And in that moment, Jason, like I let go of the rules. I'd been living a life of should and supposed to. I was trying to fit myself into this perfect box that doesn't exist, by the way. And it wasn't working. And in that new thought, it was stop trying to be somebody else and just be who I created you to be. And that became my passion. I was so curious about who God had created me to be, that potential that he had placed inside of me when he created me. Because I believe he was intentional with me. I believe he was intentional when he created you. And I became so curious about this woman that he had created and I wanted to experience her. And that became my passion. And the business was simply a vehicle to stretch me, to create opportunities, to allow me to use my skills in a way that was making a difference and an impact in the world. And that's what I was curious about. That's what I was passionate about. And that's what I'm still passionate about today. I, I, you know how much I love that. There's so many different levels to that. Number one, I, I echo your desire and, and understanding that there are really successful professional entrepreneur women out there, but they're difficult to, to find. They're like yeah. finding you to be on the show. Like I haven't had a ton of women on the show and it's not because I don't look for them and I don't, I don't want them to be on the show, but that, so I agree that that is a hard thing, but here's the other part of that, that I really, really love is that I want the listeners who are listening to this on no matter whatever podcast player they're listening to or watch on YouTube or whatever, listen to what she said. Katie didn't build the business because she was necessarily passionate about the products. Although that part is part of it. She sure. built the business for a bigger thing. And I love what you said, Katie, about my passion was to create the woman who was going to be that inspiration for other people. And the vehicle was the business to do that. Mm-hmm. I, I can, I, my accidental entrepreneurship, maybe, maybe that's a theme of accidental entrepreneurs, but my accidental maybe. entrepreneurship was very similar. It's like I, when I started my first big company, it wasn't that I was passionate about the thing or the company itself, but the company was a vehicle to provide for my family. And I wanted to create the ability to make an income for my family in a way that I couldn't, I couldn't see myself making any other way. I really appreciate that part of your story. Now, the other, the other two keys, like, like there's five keys. The first one was passion. We just talked about that. The other, the next two keys are being at the right place at the right time mm-hmm. and knowing the right people. And they're all P's, by the way, if you haven't listened to the show, it's passion, place, people. Those are the first three. Love it. So on place, what store were you in? What store were you walking around in that day when Merrill approached you? Do you remember? Yeah, it was one of those small boutiques that I ended up selling to. And it was called Nana's, my, my Nana's Cottage. She wow. was a and- grandmother who I like, I, I wish I could find her and interview her. But I, my guess is she maybe had some regrets in her life. And that's why she woke me up that day. Like, 
wake up girl. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you've I'm, got... I'm a grandma and I'm living in regret. Like don't do what I've done. <laughs> so you've got, so, so being at the right place at the right time is such an important key to success as entrepreneurs. And it's not about luck. It's not about just being, whoops, I happen to be somewhere that was amazing. It, it's putting yourself in those places. So yes, that first store, that Nana's cottage that you were shopping in happened to be an amazing place that catapults you, catapults you into other you know, levels of success. But you know, you went to that trade show, you put yourself yeah. in that trade show, you went to the next trade show, you went to this thing, you yeah. went to that thing, you put yeah. yourself in those places. So I think that's an il- illustration of place, being in the right place at the right time and staying at home all the time or staying in your job all the time is not ever going to be the right place. There are other places to go to be successful. The third key of, of knowing the right people, obviously, we all know now, it's Merrill. Merrill, not, not, not the only person, but Merrill was that first catalyst that said, hey, this is amazing. Show me this stuff. I'll buy this stuff. And not only Merrill, but I think Ben has a lot to do with this too, oh, yeah. <laughs> because he was so, I love how you talk about your husband. Cause I, I know my wife, we've been married almost 27 years. She's my best friend. She's, she's everything to me. And I can hear you when you're talking about him, you, you refer to him kind of the same language that I refer to yeah. my wife. So are those, are there any other people besides Marilyn Ben that you could point? Yeah. These people were keys to my success. Yeah. I mean, like I described really early on, I was unsure of myself as a designer. And so I needed a lot of pushing and I think God knew that. And he just kept putting people in my place, uh, in front of me. And there was a global creative director at Nike. We had a mutual friend. We were at a baby shower. I was gifting some of those handmade sewn on my mom's 1962 to Bernina products. And he, same thing. He pulled me aside. He was like, Hey, let's manufacture these things overseas. And I was like, okay, you're creative director at Nike. Hmm. And you like my stuff. Interesting. (laughs) Like maybe I'm kind of good at this stuff. Um, there were, Oh, I, Merrill forced me to go to a trade show. It was a small trade show in Portland that was at a hotel and I didn't have a booth or anything, but I just had product in a bag that I had made. And then the products were also products that I made in literally every booth that I walked into, I was just, I kept getting attacked Jason by women who were like, where'd you get this bag? And what are these cool shoes? And so I I just needed a lot of proof and evidence, but those people were there. And I, when you talk about places and even people, like, as I think about my journey and my experiences, the key places that really helped me go to a next level. And there's always another level, right? There's never any one thing that made the huge difference. It's all of it together. But as I think about all of those places that I went, the trade shows, the stores, the trips to meet sales reps, all of those experiences were so uncomfortable for me. And so being willing to go outside of your comfort zone, because there's no growth in the comfort zone and there's no comfort in the growth zone. And once I started to really realize that, I could talk to myself and talk to my nerves and my anxiety and be like, look, this is uncomfortable. And that's why we're excited about it because that means something incredible is on the other side of this. And so I just, I started seeking out the discomfort because I knew that's where the growth was. I knew that's where the people, I knew that's where the opportunities would be. And if there's resistance, if we're going to, can we talk about God here? Like, Oh yeah. (laughs) Like the resistance is there to teach us something. And it's also the adversary trying to stop you from experiencing your growth and your potential becoming who God created you to be. And so that resistance became a beacon in a sense. And it was like, I was paying attention to what was uncomfortable and anxious for me because that meant one adversary was trying to stop me. And I was like, you're not stopping me. Like, I know what I'm, I'm going after. And so I would, I could convince myself to go through those experiences, go to those places for that reason. Well, I love what, I love what you said. I don't think I ever heard anybody say it quite the way you did, but there's, there's no growth in the comfort zone, which I think we've heard said before, but then you flip that. You said, there's no comfort in the growth zone Yes, and you've got to seek out the discomfort. And I think that's one of the keys to success. Just generally speaking is that entrepreneurs who are successful are comfortable with discomfort. They seek it out, not in a sadistic kind of way, but they understand that that's where the beauty is going to happen. And I tell people in my coaching classes all the time, my cohorts are running like, guys, I could teach you this and we could sit and I'm giving you the tools, but the magic is in the action. You've got to go out and do it. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be hard, but you got to go do this because sitting in a session with me while fun and entertaining is not going to be where the, where the growth happens. You've got to get out there and do it. So I love the way you said that the, um, 
Because the information, last... information just lives in our head. And you know this That's information right. just lives in our head. And it's not until we start applying it that suddenly we embody it and we've experienced it. And then it becomes a knowing, which is different. It's not just living in your head. It's in your whole body, your being. Yeah. Well, I love, I love that because there's information, which is, which is facts and figures, black and white. There's knowledge. There's the understanding. That's what knowledge is of that information. But then there's wisdom. There's the proper application of that knowledge, knowing when to execute, when to pull back, knowing. And I think those are the three levels. You got info, you got knowledge, you got wisdom. And so many people are still living, but either in info and maybe a knowledge, but they never apply it through wisdom. They never seek out like you're a great designer. That's evident. People told you you were great, but your wisdom led you to turn that into a multi-million dollar international company. Knowledge and information never does that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so let, let and me even a great this. product can't do that. that that's right. <laughs> like, it's one piece of it, but as we have learned, there's so much more to it than just a great product. Well, your preparation to be successful. Um, and that's the fourth piece preparation, your fourth or your preparation. I look, I look at your background when I mean, you told your story early on about you got, you got accepted to college, you get these, these scholarships, you were, it was all about design. You wanted to be a designer. So your whole life prepared you for this because you, you couldn't have been a mom of two kids and had no design experience, no design understanding. And then just, yeah, I'm going to make a handbag and it's going to sell millions of dollars. And you were prepared for this. And I think that most entrepreneurs who are successful, I think they can point to a they were successful in a certain industry or business because they were prepared. And I think what your story does is encourage people who are listening to say, okay, what am I prepared to do? What am I prepared to be successful at? Am I good at sales? Am I good at math? Am I good at talking to people? Am I good at some unique thing like making stuff? Like not everybody's good at that. So I think your preparation was in that. Is that the way you see it? That's how you were prepared to be successful? Absolutely. And, you know, yes, I developed a skill in product design in school. Um, but I, like, as you use that word prepare, I really think of my relationship with God and the willingness that I have to, you know, pray to him every day to read scriptures and look, I'm not perfect. I'm not a scriptorian. I, um, you know, I, I didn't even see myself as like a, a, super righteous person. I I thought like there was a lot, a long ways to go, but I think I've consistently had this desire to have a connection with God and to figure out how to be who he created me to be. I'll I'll give an example. Um, I had an experience when I was in college that taught me to listen to my inner voice. And I was dating this guy. He was a good guy nice guy. Um, we were good friends actually for a year before we even started dating and we were dating for several months. And I just felt strongly like I needed to break up with him. And it was really excruciating for me. I had a big ego apparently at the time. And I was like, well, what's going to happen to him when I'm not his girlfriend? Like who's going to take care of him. Right. (laughs) And so I was worried about him if I were to break up with him and I was praying, I was reading scriptures and the, the pattern that I've used in my life um, is to say prayer and ask specific questions of God and then open scriptures and I'll read just wherever they land. And so I, I was feeling this impression that maybe I needed to break it off with him, but I didn't understand why. And so I opened my scriptures to hear God speak to me. And I opened to Psalms 4610. And if you know that scripture at all, it says, be still and know that I am God. And I was like fighting him in a sense. Like he was giving me an answer. He was telling me what to do. And I was fighting him. And I could like hear my head arguing with him. And in that moment, it was like, Katie, just will you listen to me? Like, calm down. (laughs) I'm giving you the answer. And that moment, it was so profound and taught me to really be still and to listen. And I use that skill set, Jason, so much in my business. I really feel like it helped me build the business that I built and it helps me in my life today. You know, people look at my life. I'm a mother of four. I've got this beautiful, committed relationship. I, I'm healthy. I'm strong. I'm an incredible business coach and I help entrepreneurs achieve really amazing things. And they're like, how do you do it all? And it's because I've made a commitment to prioritize stillness and listening to that inner voice. 
That's so many people don't don't pay attention to that. And I think that beyond the spiritual side of that, there's the concept of just taking time off. I know in, in the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments is to uh, to observe the Sabbath day. Now, whether we could get into the details of what that means, but the principle of taking a time to rest from your business, yeah. rest from your toil, rest from your work is so good. And that's part of what I do you know, as a coach, just like what you do in your coaching is I teach people, listen, you've got to design your life to where you are running things, not they are not running you. And you can take the time away to, to relax and spend time away from the office, away from emails, away from text messages. And in those moments are when some of the most amazing things happen. I know that, you know, so I've had some great ideas. I take, I try to take a week off every month to go somewhere, uh, not a full hundred percent disconnect week, but like a week away from the office with my wife, we go somewhere and do something. And I can tell you a lot of times when I come back, I'm like, Hey, I thought about this while I was sitting in the hammock out in the woods, smoking my pipe. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like I wasn't even thinking about anything and it just came to, came to my mind. And I love what you're saying there, because as you and I are, are followers of Jesus, as we, as we understand what God's trying to say to us, we understand that there is this stillness where we can hear God's voice to lead us to that next thing. But beyond that, whether you believe in Jesus or God or not, there's still right. the concept. It's still true yes. that just get still. Yes. Cool, cool things will happen. Yeah. I want to, I want to finish the five P's, the five keys of success with the word plan. Cause that's the, that's the shortest word, but I think, and I think for your story, um, what I heard here, Katie, was that your design acumen as a designer mm -hmm. led you to plan in a way that most entrepreneurs aren't planning because yeah. you're looking at the construct <laughs> of all the contingencies, everything that's got to happen just as much as you looked at the word for your company. I mean, that was yeah. pretty planned out. So your, your key to success was in a part of, part of that was in planning. You agree? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And my way of planning, like you said, is totally different than most people's. Um, the way I teach my clients is I show them how to create what I call a compass sketch. And a compass sketch includes a very powerful North Star, a strong why, one that has deep meaning and purpose to you, and that you can set your sights on and that you can be really focused on and continually making decisions that are moving you one step closer to that North Star. And the visual that I create for my clients is you've got this North Star and you're in some boat in the ocean. You're like, you're practically in a dinghy and you're trying to make it to this North Star and it feels impossible. And my plan, in a sense, is to take you and in that dinghy and to lasso yourself to that North star. And you might swing to the left a little, you might swing to the right. We're not making this perfect every step of the way plan because you and I don't know what's around the corner 10 days from now, two years from now. Like we just don't know what's around the corner and we're going to gain more information. And once you have that greater perspective, the plan's going to need to change. It will, it's going to need to shift. And that's why it's called a compass sketch because this is a plan subject to change. God's going to give you opportunities, life, the universe, whatever you want to call it. Things are going to show up in front of you that you couldn't plan for that you weren't expecting. And if you aren't open to that happening, you're going to start saying no to some really incredible opportunities and things because it's not part of the plan, right? So we can't, so it's important to have a plan, have a North Star, have a direction that you're headed, but be open to new ways showing up that are going to help you get there maybe faster, better, uh, that you weren't expecting. So we have a plan, we have a strategy, we're moving along and we're open to the possibility that there's going to be better ways that we just can't see right now. There's a lot of wisdom, a lot of wisdom in that. And I, there's this thing that I teach called uh, the law of separation. I didn't come up with it. It's kind of one of those laws that God put in, put into uh, design when he designed everything. But the law of separation says that we must stay committed to our vision unchangingly, yet the strategies to achieve the vision are going to change innumerable times. Yeah. So when you put your sketch together with your clients, it's like you keep that North star. This is the visions where we're aiming. The vision is going to stay consistent. You don't want to be wishy-washy in the vision, but your strategies to get there, just like when you started zoo and then it went to pudge, it was still the same vision, but new strategies to achieve yes. success. So yep. I got to ask this question. This is the root of all success. So how does Katie Richardson define that word? What does success in your word, what does that mean? 
There's a couple elements of this for me. Um, success first and foremost is inner peace. Like when you're sitting alone and the TV's not on and your phone's not out and there's not even a book that you're reading and maybe you're even having to wait and it's just you and your head and your thoughts. Are you in a place of peace? Are you happy? Are you comfortable within your life? Um, my, my clients know that like every time they call me and we have a call and they ask how I'm doing, I tell them I'm doing amazing. And it's true. Like I love being Katie Richardson. And to me, that is success. I don't want to be somebody else. I want to be me. And more and more, I seek to be the greatest version of myself and to continue to grow and expand. But for me, like that is success. And beyond that, it's, being me with my kids and being able to be present with my kids it means going on weekly dates with my husband and like having that open communication and that deep conversation and that strong relationship and that desire to continue to move towards our North star. It means having a strong and committed relationship with God and continuing to explore new ideas and ways that I can strengthen that relationship and not just get lost in routine, but really hearing him more and more in my life. It means being healthy and strong and serving and helping other people. Um, that's why I love doing what I'm doing right now. Coaching is I get to see people take their gifts and their talents and really thrive. And you, like, so one of the things that I do is help people bring their magic into the world. And what is magic? Well, it's not just some invisible nebulous thing. The way I describe magic is it's your skill that you have honed, that you have chosen to develop, um, right? There's that choice to pursue this thing combined with your calling. You're calling from God, you're calling from the universe, but however you want to view it. But it's, it's, take, it's, it's more than just the skill and the ability, right? It's more than just being good at something. It's purposeful, it's meaningful. And when you pursue that, your life becomes fulfilling. And that to me is success. And with that as a definition, do you consider yourself a successful person? 100%. 100%. Intentionally. <laughs> I like I have created that success in my life. And, you know, if we had another hour, I could tell you all of the other, like you've, we've heard a lot of the highlight reel of Katie Richardson. I have the not so highlight reel and I have the <laughs> excruciating stories of failure, of frustration, of, you know, falling flat on my face of losing funding, of, you know, running out of money, of having cl doors closed in my face, of, you know, launching things that didn't succeed. And it's being willing and committed to continue to keep going and pursuing that greater version of yourself. Yeah. That to you me are is you're such an inspiration. And I, I really, I, even from the first time we met and had that dinner, you know, sitting at that dinner table together in Denver, when we did, I, I just, there's a spark in your eyes. There's, there's a, there's something in your voice that I think is infectious. People like it. And uh, I, I know that as people are listening to this, they're going to say, I'm gonna, I need to look this lady up. So um <laughs> Let me ask you for this as we finish the show today. I want to, uh, and I'm going to give you the opportunity at the end to kind of tell how people sure. can get in touch with you. But before we get to that part, what what I want you to think about is there are a lot of people that listen to the show that are on the very early stages of entrepreneurship. Like you and I are both accidental entrepreneurs. There are some people out there that are thinking about it, but they haven't they haven't executed yet. They haven't stepped out in faith to do the thing. What would be your advice to them? What would you say to that person right now that hasn't yet started? What would you say to yeah. them? Well, we're at the end of the podcast and you've learned some really incredible things today. And I want to invite you to reflect on what we have said. And there's specifically going to be one thing that was really popped out for you. And right now that thing is kind of like we talked about, it's living in your head, it's information and insight alone will not transform your reality. It just simply will not. You could read every book in the universe about life and success and growth, and it won't change your life. But what will change your life is putting that principle into action. And so my invitation to you right now is to one, identify that one thing that you're hearing for you. And two, ask yourself, how can I attach this to action and bring it into my reality in the next 24 hours? Like, what are you committed to doing about what you have learned? Take that insight, attach it to action, commit to doing it and go do it. 
I, I love that. And, and what's really interesting is that if you go back, if I could do a montage of all the answers to that question, because I ask that of everybody, um, the, so many people are saying the same kind of thing. Take action. You got to go do this. Quit thinking about it. Go do it. The, the magic, as you use the term, the magic is in the action. It's in the activity. It's the doing of the thing. So, Katie, how can people get in touch with you if they wanted to reach out? Say, I'm interested to know who this lady is, maybe to hire you as a coach, engage with you, be there when you're speaking. How would they get in touch with you? I mean, you can find me on Instagram, katie.live. I have a podcast of my own called What's Working Now. And the whole purpose of that podcast is to really help you see the greatness that God has placed inside of you. And I really feel like that's the gift that he gave me. And to, to kind of, um, I didn't share young Katie very much. Young Katie felt very invisible in the world. And I was the fourth of six kids. When I was three, my mom had twins and she was a very busy woman. She had her hands full. And in that process, I just believed that I was a nobody and became very invisible. And it was, you know, as a toddler, that's cool, right? You can get away with a lot. <laughs> but as you grow up in junior high and high school, being invisible is really, really painful. And so when I learned who God had created me to be, it moved me in action. And that is what I do with my clients. Like, I know that I can teach you all kinds of things about business and marketing and product, but if you can't begin to believe in yourself, you won't take action. Yeah. And it's the core of what I do. It's like, I, like when you begin to really see who God created you to be, you become so hungry. That fire burns bright and you become passionate, not just about you, but you, you become passionate about other people too. Because not only do you begin to see that greatness within you, you see it in other people and that becomes exciting and it drives you, it motivates you and it connects you to people in a way that like no headline marketing message clickbait can ever, can ever compete with. And so when you understand this, you become you don't have competition. <laughs> like you become so unique and special. There's only one place people can get it and it's with you. And um, that's your opportunity. So I, I mean, I, this is what I teach people combined with the, the really incredible strategies and formulas for business and it works Jason. So yeah, I've got, I've got gifts for you in my Instagram profile. You can just click on my Instagram profile and I've got some incredible free audios and a business diagnostic. Um, go get my help. Because All right. So go find Katie you. Richardson, <laughs> find Katie Richardson at Katie, K-A-T-I-E dot live, L-I-V-E on Instagram. And also you can go look up her podcast, What's Working Now. Uh, I was actually a guest on her show not too long ago. And I yeah. think that you would be, you'll find some really interesting guests and interesting information on her show. And you can definitely hear in her voice about what she's trying to accomplish with helping people just like you as an entrepreneur to get to that next level of success. So Katie, I want to say again, how honored I am to have you on the show. I'm glad that we now know each other. Our universes have collided and we now are going to, I hope, continue to do some work together and events and that type of thing in the future. But thank you for being here on the show today. It means a lot that you're here. Thank you so much. Jason, you're very welcome. It's been an honor. Thank you for giving me a chance to share my story. Well, there you have it. Another story of a, an amazingly successful entrepreneur, uh, especially having a woman on the show. I love, I love it when I find very successful entrepreneurs like Katie to be on the show. But you heard in her story uh, the things that she was talking about and, and her five keys of success. We talked about her passion and we talked about being in the right place at the right time and knowing the right people. And those are certainly things that are true in everybody's story and her preparation, which got her to the place where she was able to be successful and her plan. So I, I want you to think about what it is that you could do what preparation do you have? Are you working in the middle of your passion? Are you putting yourself in the right place? Are you going out there meeting people? What are you doing to be successful? Because just like what Katie said, and we talked about on the show, it's not just the information. It's just not, not just the knowledge. It's about wisdom, which is the right application of those things. So are you applying it? Are you ready to take action? Here's one of the things I want to offer to you. 
I am, uh, I have something on my membership on my website at the real You can go there and look up services. And I have a membership called the successful entrepreneur. And what it is, it's a monthly uh, membership that you, it's only $55 a month. And what you get access to is you get three to four live trainings with me and other experts like Katie, that we're actually going to sit down and teach you and coach you want, you know, through zoom, through live sessions where you'll see how to be more successful as an entrepreneur. So it's this elite online training program for today's and tomorrow's successful entrepreneurs. So for instance, I do an ask Jason live Q and a, I do an hour long Q and a, so it's like getting your own business coach with me uh, once a month. I also do a couple of success lectures every month where I deep, go deep in a, a singular topic. And then I also do an entrepreneur master series. I do that once a month where I bring in an entrepreneur from outside and I uh, tap into his or her unique excellence and skills and whatever thing that they do and give you some tactical information about how to use that to be better as an entrepreneur. So if you'll go to the real slash T S E, which stands for the successful entrepreneur, you can sign up now. It's only $55 a month and you get access to some amazing world-class entrepreneurial training. Well, there you have it. I'm the real Jason Duncan. That was the root of all success for this episode. Tune in next week when I talk again with another amazingly successful entrepreneur about his or her journey to success. Until then, remember, Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success.